Welcome to the next in our series of videos on demystifying IFRS 9 for corporates. I'm Sandra Thompson, I lead our Global Accounting Technical Group for Financial Instruments and I'm here today with Claire Howes. Claire works in the UK helping our UK clients as they implement IFRS 9. Now in previous episodes we've taken you through the requirements of IFRS 9. Of course IFRS 9 is now very nearly here after a long time waiting. What we're going to do today is focus particularly on what you need to think about ahead of this year end, so ahead of the date when you actually adopt IFRS 9. So Claire, can you kick us off? What's the top of your list? Well, if you want to avoid accidental P&L volatility, top of my list would be sorting out your hedge documentation. You need to update it for IFRS 9. You don't need to say how you're going to test effectiveness anymore, but you do need to explain how you're going to prove there's an economic relationship and say what your sources of ineffectiveness are going to be. And also, if you're going to change your hedging strategy to take advantage of any of the things we commented on in the previous videos, then you need to document that too. So are you going to start hedging components? Do you want to hedge a net position? Are you going to defer some of the costs of hedging going forward? You need to think about that before you actually start the next year. Yeah, and I like that phrase when it comes to hedge accounting, you kind of live or die by your hedge documentation. So if it's not in your hedge designation, unfortunately, you can't do hedge accounting for it. Yeah, exactly. And am I right that some companies are actually thinking about not doing IFRS 9 hedge accounting at all? That's right. So you can actually defer IFRS 9 for hedging only. And some companies are realising they haven't got time to update all the hedge documentation. Or actually, because they want to change the strategy, there's going to be some quite complicated systems changes and they want to give themselves the time to do that properly. So you can defer IFRS 9 until you've sorted all that out and move to it at a later stage, either when macro hedging gets finalised or actually just when you are ready to move to IFRS 9 for hedging only. So if you decide not to adopt IFRS 9's hedge accounting at 1st of January 2018, could you go at a later date? You certainly can, whenever suits you. Okay, very useful tip there. So if you're not quite ready, you do have the option to defer. But IFRS 9 isn't all about hedging. What might companies do this year end to make classification and measurement easier under IFRS 9 next year? Yeah, thanks Claire. So as you say, it's not all about hedge accounting. There are some important classification and measurement choices to make. The first thing I want to talk about is business model. You'll probably recall from one of our earlier videos that how you classify financial assets, things like receivables, investments in debt securities, depends in part on your business model. Now the business model assessment is done when you first transition to IFRS 9. So for most companies that's the 1st of January 2018. And it's not a choice, it's, but it can be a judgement. And it's very much based on how management actually manages the assets they have as at the 1st of January 2018. So therefore it's important to look at how you're actually separating your assets and managing them. Let's bring this to life with an example. Many companies will factor some of their debts. Now, if you put those trade receivables, for example, in one business model, it's likely they'll be held to collect and sell because you're factoring some and selling some and then holding others, and that will get you fair value through OCI. But you may be able to separate those receivables into two portfolios, those you do factor, which are held for sale, probably fair value p and but not on the balance sheet for very long, and those that you intend to hold and collect the contractual cash flows as they fall due, those will be held to collect an amortised cost. I said before, you need to do that before you transition to IFRS 9 at the start of January 2018. A similar point might apply if you have holdings of spare cash, maybe you're holding them for a period and you spend it on something like CapEx. Um, again, there could be a rump of cash that's there really for a crisis, and you might say we hold those kinds of investments to collect contractual cash flows, but there's others that perhaps you intend to dip in the shorter term and they could be held to collect and sell. And again, you might be able to segregate those assets. And while I'm on the subject of investments, one thing to bear in mind is that if you have holdings in funds, things like money market funds or other funds, then those may well not be eligible for amortised costs at all. Um, if you can cash in those funds by putting the instruments back, those will be debt investments, but they'll typically fail the SPPI test, so therefore be at fair value through P&L. So that's debt investments, but aren't the changes for equity investments going forward as well? Yeah, there certainly are. So under IFRS 9, all holdings of equity investments, whether they're strategic investments or shorter term investments in equities, they'll all be measured at fair value. The option you had in IS39 to use costs for an unquoted equity investment has gone. 
which means practically you need a process to estimate that fair value. And if you haven't got that already, you need to be putting that in place. The other thing to bear in mind is that for equity investments that are not held for trading, which is the vast majority of those by corporates, you have a one-time election to report the changes in fair value through OCI rather than the income statement, the fair value OCI election. But that is a one-time election and you need to make it when you first transition to IFRS 9, so again 1st of January 2018. So something else to do now. So that's quite a lot about accounting, but you may have heard noises being made about disclosures. Claire, what's happening here? So disclosures is very important. IS8 requires companies to disclose the impact of any new accounting standards. And it might be very easy to say, I still don't know the impact of the new accounting standard, either IFRS 9 or IFRS 15. But by the time you sign your 2017 accounts, you're going to be into 2018. You're going to be accounting under this new standard. So it's not very easy to disclose, I don't know what the impact will be. The market might not be very happy about that one. They might not be. So the market is very interested in what people disclose in their 2017 accounts and the regulators are very interested as well. The regulators have recently set out statements saying we expect disclosures to be entity specific. We expect quantitative and qualitative disclosure. And we expect you to explain the judgments you've taken or the options. For example, the option to disclose equity investments at fair value through OCI, as you mentioned. So the important thing here is be detailed, give as much information as you can and warn the markets, warn the investors about what might be coming up so that they aren't surprised when they get the 2018 results. Thank you. So just to recap what we've been through today, there are certain things to think about ahead of adoption in 2018. As Claire said, the first is hedge accounting. Make sure you've got your hedge designations correctly in place, particularly if you want to adopt some of the new flexibility in IFRS 9, and make sure you know whether you are going to IFRS 9 at all. And then finally, but by no means least, we talked about disclosure. Both the requirements in IS8, the expectations of regulators, but probably more important, the expectations of the market, and being able to reassure them so they don't get nasty surprises. So that's it from us to today, and indeed that's the last in our planned series on IFRS 9 for corporates. So all that remains is to wish you the very best of luck. Bye-bye.